morning, everyone. Hopefully it's a lovely Saturday where you're at. Let us know where you're at in the chat. North Carolina. Hopefully you won't be Georgia. Sunny California, it's still early where you're at. Minnesota, Minnesota is in the house. Glad it's beautiful in North Carolina. I'm in Jersey and it is a gorgeous day. Canada, welcome Canada. We'll get started here in a few minutes. I was just letting everybody get into the webinar. Um, this is a five part series today. Um, you don't have to attend them all, but I think I do believe I sent the links for everybody. So if you choose to attend it, no, not a problem, but um, welcome everybody. And um, I'm Lori Davin on, on behalf of NAPT, I'd like to welcome you to the 2022 Leadership Symposium. Um, this is our day one. We have another session next Saturday with Rebecca Rose. Um, with the five sessions today, there will be a half hour break between each session, so you'll be able to do what you have to do, grab your lunch, grab your breakfast, wherever you're at, so um, we're glad you're here with us today. Our first topic today is toxicity in the workplace with Melissa Tompkins from South Coast Vet Solutions, um, but before we get started, just a few housekeeping roles. Everyone's muted just so there's no background noise for anyone. If you have a question that you want to ask me, you can put it in the chat to me and I will try to help you out. Otherwise, um, for the questions, the Q&A, um, Melissa, did you say you wanted to go ahead and wait till the end? I don't think we finished discussion. This oh, you season. didn't. Um, so if people have questions in the chat, then you can, you know, I can pause a couple of times for people and you can tell okay. me if there's anything there. But if, if you really have a question, put it into the Q&A because that way they all stay together where if everyone's talking in the chat, a question will get lost because that's real time. So if you really want, have a question that you want an answer to, and we'll get to those at the end of the session, um, you know, put it in the Q&A and we'll take it from there. Um, so as I stated, Melissa is with us today. Um, and just a quick bio on Melissa. She started working in the veterinary field in 2003, starting out as a tech assistant receptionist. Well, you really started down low and worked your way, huh? She worked her way up to become a practice manager in 2005, and she never looked back. Good for you, Melissa. She's worked in general practice, feline only, specialty and emergency. She earned her bachelor's degree in animal science from Cal Poly Pomona in 2005 became a certified veterinary practice manager in 2011. And then in 2020, she earned her PHRCA certification and also became a certified compassion fatigue professional. She has helped multiple veterinary professionals deal with burnout and compassion fatigue. She owns her own management consulting business, South Coast Veterinary Management Solutions, so she can help multiple hospitals with training and other business needs. In 2008, she was the Southern California Veterinary Medical Association's Professional of the Year, and then in 2015, she was nominated for DVM 360's Practice Manager of the Year. Congratulations. She is a published author of multiple articles in DVM360.com, Veterinary Practice News, Veterinary Team Brief, 
First Line Magazine, Veterinary Economics, and VPN Plus. She has also been a speaker at several annual conferences and symposium, including VHMA's Management Exchange, CVS's Veterinary Forum, Oklahoma's Annual Conference, ACES's Conference, AAF, AAFP National Conference, the Vet Show, and multiple local or virtual symposiums. <clears throat> In 2016, she also helped train veterinarians on how to create a feline-friendly practice through AVSG's annual wet lab. Melissa is highly active within the local veterinary community, co-founding the North Orange County Veterinary Hospital Manager Group and the Southern is that SoCal Veterinary Managers Network and is on the board of trustees for the SCVMA. She loves helping other managers and team members grow within the veterinary profession. She spends her free time running or walking in 5Ks and half marathons, and she also spends time with her friends and families. She shares her home with her husband, stepson, and their furry babies. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. It's always really weird to have someone read information about you and you always sound cooler than I think you, than I really feel, but thank you for the introduction. I appreciate that. So thank you guys for joining me. I wish I could see your, your little faces on my screen, even though a lot of people don't like being on camera. I love being able to get a snapshot of everybody. So I'm sorry I don't get to see you because this is a webinar and not just a regular chat, but I'm excited you guys are here today and hopefully uh, you'll be able to get some information from me that you can take away back to your, I don't say back to your hospital, but for your personal use and how, what you can relate to. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to make my first screen. Okay. So today, this first session, I'm going to talk to you about toxicity in the workplace. And we're going to talk about it from a lot of different ways. So hopefully you guys will have some good understanding about what I'm going to go over. She's already talked about me, so I don't need to do any of that except to point out that this is Blackie that I'm holding. This was actually my first practice. The picture's a little older. I might need to change it now, but he was such a good office cat, so I love to show him in different presentations that I'm doing. So what I would love you to do is hopefully you're not on your cell phone watching this. If you are, it's okay, but I'm actually have you use your cell phones in a few slides. So if you don't have your cell phone accessible, if you want to grab it, because I'm going to ask you to fill out some question or answer some questions through your cell phone. So if you don't have it on you right now, please grab it. Uh, and if you're on it watching, that's okay, because you can still use it somewhat uh, for my polling questions that I'm going to ask you. So let's go ahead and get started. What does a toxic workplace look like? You know, there is a lot of different components to toxicity in the workplace, and I'm sure you guys have your own thoughts about what you feel that it is. And so we're going to talk about some different things. And one of the things that I've noticed that can lead to toxicity in the workplace is if people are actively arguing, actively fighting, you know, maybe you have a really, not to say aggressive, but maybe a really assertive um, practice owner or manager or each other, you know, this doesn't have to be specific to leadership. This definitely can be even interpersonal within team members. And you have people that are maybe yelling or shouting or talking somewhat aggressively. And even if you're not part of that conversation, that can lead to some toxicity because it's very emotionally charged. And there's a lot of feelings with that, that, you know, you definitely absorb those vibes. You know, have you ever felt like you walk into the hospital and you feel like that tension, like you, the air is so thick, you can cut it, you know, that kind of thing. So people being argumentative can absolutely create a toxic work environment or lead pieces of the, of the work environment to be toxic. And if they're actively being rude or mean or aggressive to one another, then that, I guess that would be like when they're being mean to you. And I say being mean, that's not necessarily the most professional verbiage, but when they're being assertive at you, obviously that's another component to this. So one of the other things that I've noticed, and this is something I've noticed in our field a lot, and I'm sure it's in other fields, but I've been in our field for so long that that's, this is what I know. We tend to have clicks. And so if you look at this next picture, this is kind of like the group of people that are picking on the other guy, you know, and even if they're not picking on them, maybe they're excluding them from things. And one thing that I've noticed that we do is we tend to not always be welcoming to new people. And we don't always, you know, greet them and try to help them feel comfortable. And we may not actively be mean to them or disrespectful, but we're kind of just ignoring them or we're not going out of our way to include them in things. And this 100% can, 
can lead to some toxicity on the new person's end because they feel like nobody really likes them because nobody's really talking to them because everybody else has their little clique of friends that they've worked together for whatever period of time. And every one of you was new at your hospital at one point, right? So wouldn't you want to go out of your way? Because you probably remember how freaky it was that first few days, you know, and you didn't know anybody and you didn't know anything and you were still learning about your practice and all that. You know, you'd think you'd want to make an effort to reach out to that new person. So for those of you who do reach, make an effort and you do do nice things for the new people, please share in the chat what you're doing at your hospital, whether you're leadership or whether you're not, it doesn't really matter because all of us can contribute to welcoming the new people and then just trying to not have the clicks that exclude others. And it's not always new people too. It can be departmentalized. You know, if you have a front versus back kind of situation where you're not talking to each other or whatever. So try to, you know, be welcoming to everyone. So if you guys are doing anything specific to go out of your way, please share in the chat. I would love to see it. The other thing that I've noticed that can be somewhat toxic, and it might not even be as obvious, this next picture is, you know, a picture of like a meeting, you know, they're having a meeting. And if you look at their faces, and obviously we don't know exactly what they're talking about, but if you look down, the lady in the center appears to be the talker and the leading, to, you know, the meeting. And the guy to her, I guess my left, I don't know why, if you're looking at the screen, I guess it's everybody's left. The guy in the plaid shirt, you know, he's kind of like, oh, whatever. He doesn't really know what she's doing. And then the two people behind her look like they're kind of having their own side conversation. The person to the far left in the back corner just looks like she's being excluded and she's got the look of shock on her face. And so we always don't, don't always notice when people are not feeling like they're part of the group or they're not being included into questions and answers. And a lot of times that toxicity can lead to other things from here on. So this is a really good snapshot of what it might look like in your practice when people are inadvertently being excluded within team meetings or group meetings or department meetings or whatever meetings you guys are having. So this, I think, I feel like is a really good snapshot of that. So what can you do about it? And we're going to talk a lot more about that. And then we're also going to talk about more specific types of toxicity. Okay. So I'm going to go to the chat really quick because I'd love to see what you guys are doing. I love it. Regular check-ins, 100%. That's great. I want to make sure to introduce myself and others. I love it. Introduce all employees. These are wonderful. Giving tours, making sure you're available. Um, mentoring. That is awesome. So important. So you guys, please check out the chat because there's really good information that people will share that they're actively doing that you might not have thought of. I know some managers actually take the new person out to lunch or they assign a buddy to take the new person out to lunch or to at least eat lunch with them on their first day. Those are wonderful, wonderful examples. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to have you grab your cell phone. You're going to go to www.menti.com and I'm going to ask you some questions. And so go there first, I'll wait, I'll leave this slide up for just a second and then I'm gonna change screens. It's always fun to change in the Zoom because I have to do a new share, but I've got it mastered, I think. So www.menti.com. And then let me go into, I'm gonna share my new screen. Okay, hopefully y'all can see my screen. Oops, okay. All right, so hopefully y'all can see it. Give me just a second. So www.menti.com. And what you're going to do. Oh, okay. Awesome. Um, Melissa, someone's asking for the code. Yes, it's 37203879. I was distracted by the fact that there was already answers in there. And I was like, whoa, I didn't expect that. So good job, guys. You're faster than me. So www.menti.com. Use the code 37203879. And please put on the screen, if you now or have worked in a toxic environment, what toxic char characteristic did you deal with most? So clicks and exclusion, clicks, demeaning comments, clicks, rudeness, gossip, hierarchy, bullying, argumentative, management that open, openly spoke negative about employees in front of others, feeling excluded, excluded or singled out for no reason, sabotage, that one's really bad. I wish I, I could do a whole presentation on just sabotage alone. Passive aggressive behavior, clicks, mentally demeaning personalities, bullying, clicks, clicks, bullying, gossip, yelling, and aggression. People that like drama, senior staff ignoring new employees. That's so common too. Bad marking others, negative attitude, shunning, exclusions, clicks, and passive aggressive bullying, clicks. I mean, you guys are seeing clicks a lot on here, right? So I want you to ask yourself have you ever been part of a click? And I want you to think about it. You may not know if you have, but have you been with a group of friends and not made the effort to include others? 
really want you guys to think about that. So talking about each other behind back, negative energy, managers not dealing with problems, all of the above, unhappy doctors, passive aggressive, rudeness, aggression. So a lot of these, working with my spouse, um, that would be difficult, I think, uh, to work with your spouse at times. Yes, bullying and guilting, not working for on days off. So I love these examples. And the good thing about when I use Mentimeter is it actually will let me download all of your comments. So I can send those to Lori if she wants to share them with you so you can guys can kind of see what the commonalities are within our field and what we're dealing with. So thank you guys so much for responding. Uh, no accountability. Uh, and a lot of these things that you guys have mentioned, we're going to talk about as being part of a toxic environment. So I'm going to go ahead and do my go back to my presentation. Feel free to put more in there because I can share it with everybody later. Okay, so how does it affect you? We have all kind of shared about what toxicities we've seen and kind of what that looks like to each other. And, but how does it affect us, right? So do you feel like this sometimes? If you are in a toxic work environment or some days are toxic because sometimes it's specific people, do you feel like this when you come in? That you're super apprehensive, you're super, I feel like this is like a nervous cat kind of situation where she is like, back off, you know? Are you feeling that when you walk in through the door? Are you kind of not happy or you're not necessarily being able to greet people warmly and be good with them because you're feeling on defense all the time? Are you feeling defensive every single time that you come into the hospital? And that obviously can have an emotional effect on us and it can really set our day. I mean, are you dreading going to work every day because you're going into this environment? You know, are you feeling depressed? Are you feeling really sad? I mean, sometimes that's how we internalize it. Some of us get kind of, we put a wall up and we get like hostile back and others internalize it. We beat ourselves up about it and we have a depression or, you know, we're really sad or whatever, all those negative components to that emotion. Are we feeling overwhelmed constantly? You know, we're in this like circle of aggression that we feel and that toxicity and that we're constantly feeling of overwhelmed and despair and, you know, in addition to the frustration and how does that affect us you know, in other ways when you come home at night, you know, or in the morning, depending on what your shifts are, are you taking the drinking alcohol? And I, I'm not, I, I enjoy a good glass of wine. I had a really good glass of wine last night, but are you turning to drinking more and more because you're trying to forget your day? You know, is that what you're using to help cope? And again, I'm not criticizing any of these things. I just want you guys to think about it. Are you utilizing something to help you cope? within the feelings that you're having. What about using, these are not illegal drugs. What about using prescription drugs? Because you need to, because you're having such anxiety or because you're having so much depression that you're actually relying on medical inter intervention, I guess, or, or medical help, because you need to use these things to help you deal with this environment that you're in. And again, I know there's a lot of people who need antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds because that's, that's normal for them because that's what they struggle with. But what if it isn't normal to you? And what if you're going through a situation that you're using those things because of that? You know, how does it affect you? So I'm going to go back to Mentimeter because what I would love to hear from you is how toxic work environments have affected you personally. So I'll go back and I'll share. It's the same code. Okay, there we go. So code 3720, if you're still in it, you should be able to answer this question. If you experience a toxic environment, how has it affected you? Now, a few years ago, when I was at one of my hospitals, I was there for a couple of years and this environment was really toxic. And I was the manager and I was doing everything I possibly could to fix it and help work within it. And unfortunately for me, it was very stressful and I was very overwhelmed and it was a constant cycle of frustration for me. And I ended up in the hospital. I ended up in the hospital vomiting blood because I was in this toxic environment. So please understand that this is not, this is everybody that we can be affected by this. I mean, I was the manager and I was having so many problems. Um, so insomnia, depression, stress, headaches, anxiety, feeling isolated and alone. Uh, I think that's a really common one that we feel. Uh, socialized less. Yeah, we don't see our friends and family because we don't feel like it. We don't want to. Depression, anxiety, it makes you not want to go into work, right? And I've told, talked to managers about this too, because I know, I know not all of you are in leadership or management in this uh, presentation, but I have talked to managers about when you have employees that are not coming into their shifts a lot, if there's a specific day, have you talked to them to see if there's something going on that, you know, they're not necessarily being flaky, that maybe there's somebody they work with that's bullying them. And I've actually talked to a lot of managers to find those things out. 
And I would also encourage you if you notice that and you're comfortable talking to team members to kind of ask them those questions too, to see if there's something you can do to help because it really is a team environment. Um, okay, so depression, anxiety, I, I see depression a lot, stress, absolutely stress. And I know Rhonda uh, Bell, who's doing the next presentation is gonna talk about some of these things and how it's affected um, other people and what she talks about. Burnout, P PSD, PTSD, uh, makes me feel anxious, stress eating, stress eating. I tend to not eat when I'm stressed. I tend to do the opposite and tend to lose a lot of weight, but not in a good way. <laughs> so I actually have the opposite problem of the eating. Uh, brought home, yep, frustrated, bring home to family, lashing out. I mean, these are all things that have affected you guys. I mean, just kind of, you can see it on your screens. And this is really, this is really like bad for us, right? So who wants to work in a toxic environment? Nobody, you know, nobody wants to be there. And, you know, upset stomach, overwhelm, numbness, anxiety. I mean, taking work home with me and hurting relationship outside of work. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're working long days and you're not getting home on time or you want to do something after work and you can't because you're staying at work longer. And um, that's another talk as well that I have that talks about self-care. And uh, I don't really believe in work-life balance, but it talks a little bit about how you can try to accomplish that. So yeah, definitely. There's a motivated to want me to uh, become management. I think that's wonderful because I think that we all can have an influence on those things. And I think that's wonderful that your goal was to do that. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my screen again. Sorry. I feel like I explain it so that you know what I'm doing. Okay, so this is for that slide. Okay, so we're going to talk now about seven signs that you or your team are in a toxic workplace. And we're going to kind of go through these individually. So leadership who wants everything their way is not, and is not flexible. People who are not team players and rude. Uh, poor communication between team members. Lack of respect towards one another and finger pointing. Inconsistent and poorly maintained policies. That's an important one. I think someone mentioned that too a couple slides ago, or I'm sorry, a couple of mentees ago. Uh, lack of proper training and gossip. Those are huge, right? So these are seven signs. So we're going to talk about these seven signs in just a second. And I'll check the chat in a moment to see if there's anything that you guys are contributing I want to share with you. So leadership who wants everything their way and is not flexible. I will be honest. I was that leader in the beginning because I really didn't know how to be a manager. I didn't have any training when I got put in that position and I wasn't perfect at it. I was, you know, inflexible. Like if it wasn't my idea, I didn't like it because I didn't know how to be comfortable within my own skin and confident enough that I could ex accept all these, one, you know, these other ideas from other people. It took me time to be able to get there. Now I'm there, but it took me time to do that. So if you have a, a newer manager, please understand that that's hard sometimes. So, but it's not necessarily a reason that they should be mean or aggressive or anything like that. So let's talk about that. So are you the toxic leader? If any of you are leaders in your practice, whether you're a shift lead, supervisor, or manager, if any of you are, I want you really to look at yourself. I have been able to see myself and my flaws and I'm definitely not perfect, but I want you to look at yourselves too. So signs you could be a toxic leader. You don't practice self-care. You give 150 and expect the same from the team. How many of you work at a hospital like that? You know, I don't, I don't have a mentee question for it, but does your practice owner expect you to, you know, give this 150 all of the time and you're working late hours every single day? You know, if the practice owner is expecting that or the manager is expecting that, that's signs that they could be being toxic and they don't realize it because they think everybody should be at this level. And I don't think everyone should be at this that level because you don't need to be. Um, sometimes they make poor decisions, indecisive or reactive. Reactivity is really bad. A lot of times we get in those situations where something happens and we decide we have to change a protocol for that. Being reactive to every single situation leads to inconsistency and poorly maintained policies. So we don't wanna be reactive all the time. And being indecisive, meaning that when someone comes to you with, with problems, they come to you with either like a specific person that they're having a problem with or a generalized problem or whatever, and we don't make a decision and take action on it. And we're so indecisive that it just festers and gets worse and worse. So this is 100% a way that you can accidentally be leading to uh, be a toxic leader. You know, you struggle with respect to others. Do you say nice things to your team? Are you snappy at them? You know, are you being polite? Are you being respectful? Uh, you're a selective communicator, meaning that you don't communicate with everybody who needs to know the information. I find that a lot of leaders in our field struggle with that because they don't think about telling everybody who needs to know. And I love communication. So my goal is if something's changing or something's happening, Whoever needs that information, I want to make sure they have it. But a selective communicator, they're not telling everybody. Maybe they only tell their favorite person or so we perceive, 
or maybe they don't tell anybody at all or however they do that. So selective communicator, 100%, meaning that not everybody knows things. You lack faith, don't believe in growth in others. Uh, that is 100%. Like if you don't believe people can grow and do more, you're not, you're not going to help them. And that absolutely can be signs you're a toxic leader. You can't shake your negative attitude. If you're constantly coming to work every day and being negative, uh, you're not going to be good with your team. And I was that leader before too. I was very negative and I had one of my, and this was before I was at my toxic environment. This was earlier. And I had, we had a very stressful day and I had an employee come in in the afternoon. Her shift was just like late in the day. And I said, you know, welcome to hell or something. And she came in and she, it put her off. It absolutely, she actually took me aside later and said, you know, Melissa, that really bothered me when you said that because I came in with such a great attitude and I was so happy. And then you said that thing and it was so negative. And it, for me, that was eye opening because she told me that. And I was like, all right. So I don't say that anymore because I know how that can affect others. It affects the culture and the thickness in the air, you know, that tension. Uh, you don't uplift others. If your ego is too big and you don't want other people to, to be successful. So look at yourself. Do you want people to grow? Do you help them grow? Because you know what? The best leaders actually help their team grow. So, okay. So leadership who wants everything their way and is not inflexible, uh, continued. When you work for a toxic leader, so what can you guys do, right? You need to look at yourself if you are that toxic leader and really internalize that and kind of sit down and say, how can I fix this, right? But if you work for a toxic leader, whether it's a shift supervisor, practice manager, practice owner, or whatever level of leadership that you're working with, there's things that you can do. And one, remember that it might be about them and not you. You know, this might not be something that you did. We have a tendency to believe that we did something bad or we did something wrong. And that's actually my next talk. I'm going to talk a lot about that, but it might not be about you. It might be about how they are. You know, like I said, for me in the beginning, I just didn't have the confidence to believe that other people could have a good answer besides myself. So that wasn't about anybody else. That was about me. So what can you do? Try talking to them about your concerns, you know, do it in private, you know, see if you can schedule some time to talk to them and say, Hey, I really want to talk to you. Can I talk to you at three o'clock today or whatever, whatever's a good time to, to speak with you and sit down with them and express whatever it is that they're doing that you're observing, you know, and if you can tell them, like, if they're a selective communicator and say, it's really hard for me to do my job when you don't tell me what's going on with this or whatever, and, and maybe helping them understand what they're doing. This is not an easy conversation. It's not easy to tell your leader or your boss or whatever that you're frustrated with them, you know, but my employee came to me and told me that what I said really bothered me. And that was eye-opening for me. And I didn't get mad at her. I apologized. So some leaders have the capability to hear you and actually understand and apologize back. Be upfront, but also come with solutions. If you know that if they approached you differently, that it would help you, tell them that. Like, hey, if you approached me this way, if you made sure to send me an email to update me on the information or whatever the situation is, telling them what they can do to help helps provide them with insight and they can also kind of be part of that. If there's another manager that you can talk to that you need help speaking with, because maybe you're not as comfortable approaching this person, depending on who they are, I would definitely go to that other manager too and say, hey, can you help me with this conversation? Um, one thing I want you to see, and hopefully you can see this because I know my screen's kind of blocking it, but I got this quote from Sharice Fontanes, who is part of the seven toxic leaders that we've been talking about. Um, historic, historic, in English. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Oh, shoot, I lost it. Um, historically, good leaders have not been able to accomplish great things alone. So that's kind of the sign. If you're a leader, you need a team and you can't do it alone. So don't try to do it alone. And I love this because it helps everybody kind of understand what they need, why they need other people around them. Okay, so now we talked about leaders because it's not always about the leadership that you have a toxic environment. You have coworkers that are toxic. So it's not always that. So one thing that I tell everybody is hire people. I'm gonna move my camera really quick because I can't read my slide. Uh, so hire people for their attitude rather than just their skills. So if you guys are understaffed, which a lot of you probably are, you need more people. Hiring warm bodies is always a bad thing. You need to hire people for the best attitudes. Those are the people that you want on your team. You may not be responsible for hiring. Maybe that's your, your supervisor or manager, whoever's doing it, but make sure that you're encouraging them to hire people with good attitudes, not just get somebody in. Because sometimes as a manager, you get that pressure from the team and you feel like I have to hire someone fast because my team is so stressed out. And then you make the worst hires a lot of the time. I've done it, so never hire a warm body just because you're short staffed, welcoming new people, which I know you guys are putting a lot of great ideas in the chat about. 
and responding when greeted. That's another one that I don't think people really understand that. And granted, not everybody's a morning person. So when people come in, you know, saying good morning, they're kind of like, oh, I need my coffee or <laughs> whatever. But trying to respond to people when they're greeting you. If someone says hello, say hello back, or at least acknowledge in general saying, hey, I'm kind of grumpy in the morning for a few. So let me come back to you, you know, or at least smile at them. Responding when greeted, when we get ignored by other people, it's actually rude. You know, I'm sure maybe you've heard of Emily Post from years and years ago of what's appropriate behavior and salutations, greetings, responding 100% appropriate behavior and what's needed to create a good working environment, responding to people when you're greeted. Give everyone a job to do during slow times too. If you know how to do 50 things and you have a newer person that doesn't necessarily know all those things, give them something they can do when it's slower. So you're not thinking that they're not working, you know, give them something that they can do that kind of helps out, puts everybody, uh, keeping everyone busy with things to do. If they're rude, talk to them about it. So again, if someone's not responding to you and you say, good morning, Take them aside and say, hey, I'd really appreciate it if you would at least acknowledge me and tell them why, because one, it's polite, but talk to them about it. I know most of us aren't comfortable with that. We feel like it's a confrontation we don't want to have. So we're more likely to talk to others about that. But, you know, sometimes by just identifying one time that you're struggling with someone, they can change their behavior because they don't realize how much it bothers you. And most people don't really want to be rude to others. I mean, I really believe that. Sometimes just our personalities, we don't understand how it's being perceived. So talk to people about it. If you talk to a manager about them, so if you're not really comfortable talking to someone directly and you go to the manager, be willing to be part of that solution too. Because as a manager, I facilitate the conversations between team members and sometimes that's what's necessary. you know. And so be willing to be part of that and say, okay, I'll sit with you and I'll have a meeting with the other person. It's really hard for managers when, or leaders any type, when someone comes to us and says, hey, I have a problem with this person, but don't tell them I said anything. Because how are we supposed to fix that? You know, sometimes it's open dialogue and encouraging open communication is essential. Okay, so remember to be nice to one another. And I love this little slide and I found it uh, online and I don't know if you've ever read this before, but I'll read it to you. All I really need to know, I learned in kindergarten. Share everything, play fair, don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. How many of you have a problem with that, right? Uh, clean up your own mess. Don't take things that are not yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. <laughs> Flush. <laughs> Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw and paint and sing and dance and play and work every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. I have a good friend who loves that one. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic, hold hands and stick together. Be aware, wonder, remember the little seed in the styrofoam cup. The roots go down and the plant goes up and nobody really knows how or why, but we all we are, are all like that. Goldfish and hamsters and white mice and even the little seed in the styrofoam cup, they all die. So do we, unfortunately. Uh, and then remember the Dick and Jane books and the first word you learned, the biggest word of all look. So the whole point of this, especially love at the beginning, be nice to one another, be respectful, be caring, apologize. All those things we learned it when we were little kids. And then somehow we just kind of stopped practicing it regularly. And maybe it's because we weren't getting in trouble, you know, like you're not in classroom and your teacher's saying, hey, please play nice with your classmate or whatever. So remembering these things and remembering to, to still be part of that. Okay. So poor communication between team members or departments. Those are huge, right? And before I go on, I'm gonna check the chat really quick to see if there's anything you guys are just sharing. It's totally, yeah. Thank you for sharing. I see, oh, I see Rhonda, stick together. Yeah, that's really great. I often feel out of the loop with last to know. I hate that. And that was my goal as a manager is to make sure that I didn't have that person that felt out of the loop or the last to know because it's such a struggle. So thank you guys for sharing those things with one another. So poor communication between team members or departments. That's another sign that you're in a toxic work environment. So avoiding that constant negative communication, as I mentioned earlier, when I, that employee came in and I said, you know, welcome to hell or whatever, there's this constant negativity that we might not even realize that we're in. And what I kind of have noticed, what I, I noticed this a lot when I went to emergency. And when I would go back, to, I'd be up in the help front, helping the front, you know, checking clients in or whatever. And this was pre-COVID when I first started to notice this. So this wasn't the eight to nine hour wait that we're experiencing right now, but 
I would go back to the treatment area and ask the doctor like, hey, do you know, do you have an estimated time when you're going to be talking to the client or, or whatever, asking for an update on time? And I would get that snappiness back. Like, well, they're just going to have to wait. You know, we've got all these da, 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 whatever. I wasn't telling the doctor that she needed to move faster or the text or anything. I just wanted to give the clients kind of an idea. And so a lot of times someone that's asking a question, the person responding to that question has a snappiness to them. And they're frustrated because they feel like they're being pressured for something. But in reality, just take the question with it, you know, like at face, I can't think of the word, like at full face or whatever, because they're just asking for an update on time. They're not telling you that you're working slow. They're not telling you that. And a lot of times we take those questions as an accusation and it's really not, it's a question. So really thinking about when people are asking you things are, how are you responding to them? Are you snapping at them or even have a negative connotation into what you're saying? You know, and I think too, we have a tendency to pick on clients. So I don't say pick, let me use a better word. We have a tendency to think badly of clients because they didn't do something medically that we think they should have. Before we got, I got into this field, I had no idea that a cat could get blocked. I had no idea that that was even a thing, right? So when you have clients that have a problem with their animal and it takes them longer to bring them in, there's things that go into their decisions. If they're not eating for a few days, they're kind of hoping that every day that that pet's going to eat, right? And then they lick the gravy and they're like, oh, they lick the gravy and they're happy and they think that's enough. So they don't understand necessarily what the negative aspects of them not eating for five days is. We do but they don't. So instead of us belittling them, even if we're not doing it to their face, a lot of this is behind the scenes where we're talking bad about what that client did in the treatment area. But think about it. We should acknowledge that the client did bring the dog in, you know? So let's, just, let's say, well, I'm really glad that you brought them in today because they already feel guilty. So we are negative a lot of times about situations going on around us. And that makes the environment negative within that. So trying to really avoid the constant negativity and really recognizing it when you're doing it or when others are doing it. And one thing I do think really helps to, to prevent toxicity is cross-training. If you work with someone periodically, you're a little bit more likely to have a good relationship them, with them, right? If it's always the front and, and the back and it's never the cross-training, they don't understand one another a lot of the times and they have to make an effort to do that. So cross-training can be really helpful. I think the best technician, honestly, is the technician who can fill in different places when necessary. They're awesome with their communication. They're awesome with their tech skills. They can help on the front if needed. They can answer the phones. I mean, honestly, those are my favorite technicians because they have the ability to do so many things. And not that I'd want to put them in the front all day, you know, because obviously I want to use your skill for your skill, but it's so wonderful when you can cross train because then you can relate to the receptionist of what they're dealing with. And they can relate to you a little bit too. This is not always the back coming to the front. I 100% believe every hospital should have the front team working in treatment for a little bit, not as a worker, like doing things, but maybe observing, see what the treatment, you know, what the treatment team's doing. If you're a general practice and you're doing spays and neuters, let the receptionist see what a spay looks like. They gown up and they watch. I mean, it's the coolest thing. So cross training can absolutely encourage positivity and good teamwork and it makes everybody understand one another better. You know, and really making an effort to look through another person's eyes. We tend to be really bad about that. We tend to judge others for their actions, but we judge ourselves for our intentions. So maybe think for a second before making a decision about why you think someone did something, maybe ask them. And that's actually my entire next talk. So I'm not going to go into detail with that, but making an effort to look at why someone may have done something the, the way that they did it before assuming they did why or why they did it. Make sure that everyone receives the same information. Again, that's that communication tool that I talked about earlier. And thinking about how what you're doing, um, I love this. I have a misprint here, sorry. What you're doing going, you know, it doesn't work. What you are doing can affect another person. Think about how what you said could affect someone. And sometimes we're all human. We're going to snap. We're going to have certain situations that we don't have the emotional ability to control that outburst that we're having. And if as long as that's not da daily and you can see it and then apologize for it, then you know it should be okay. But if it's a daily thing or you're never apologizing, that's a whole other situation. So really think about what you're doing and how it affects others. Okay, number four of the seven reasons, lack of respect towards one another and finger pointing. This one is huge, guys. I actually love this picture because it shows everybody trying to work as a team. And I love that, that concept and dynamic. But seeking team solutions to individual problems, working with each other, 
If you're all having a problem with communication, let's sit down and talk about how we can avoid this. Maybe you get walkie talkies. Maybe you don't know when someone's in the front getting checked in. Maybe there's like there's holes in that. Think of ways together as a team that you can actually solve that problem. And that encourages teamwork and team building. I actually have a talk on team building and it's so important because there's so much of it. We, we work every day with other people, you know? So seeking team solutions to individual problems sometimes is helpful. And accepting responsibility for your own actions. You make a mistake, own it and say you're sorry. You know, it, nobody's perfect. And I'm gonna talk about the leaders in just a second because the leaders absolutely can, can help that better. If you're snapping at people all the time or you're not accepting their accountability and you're finger pointing, that's huge. Okay, so be nice to each other. We've already talked about that a lot. I feel like you guys should be cool with that. But leaders, don't create an environment where everyone automatically gets in trouble for things or you're always constantly finding blame on someone. You know, there are situations where when something happens, you might need to investigate to figure out, okay, how did this happen? Why did it happen this way? Especially if it's a safety thing or somebody was injured or, or whatever. Um, but don't finger point. If someone comes to you and says, hey, I accidentally, like my first, like first or second shift, I was helping with a cat and the cat kicked the clippers off the counter and broke them. And I was only like helping restrain the feet, but I didn't know what I was doing yet. So of course I couldn't hold the feet and the cat bunny kicked it. And so I went to my, my previous manager and I said, I'm so sorry I did this. I'll pay for it. Cause I didn't know. And then she started to laugh and she's like, Melissa, it happens. Don't, don't worry about it. And her mentality to me, when I went to her super worried about these clippers was life-changing, you know, and that's thankfully was my first experience with her as a manager. And, and she was really was great. But leaders don't automatically get people in trouble. She could have easily turned at me and got mad because that was the last pair we had or whatever, and she didn't. So I ask all leaders to really look at that. Don't blame your team. Allow them to tell you when they've made a mistake. Don't have an environment of negativity with that. And don't think that everyone should just get in trouble. That makes it really hard for people to ever want to admit they made a mistake if they feel like they're going to get in trouble all the time because that's what's actually happening. You don't want to do that. And reacting, I've already talked about that a little bit. Don't react to situations. When something happens, and you might want to change a protocol or policy, think about it before you do it. Sit on it and say, okay, let me think about this. And maybe take, talk to the team about it because sometimes you don't need to change an entire thing just because of one situation. If you have one client complaint, but 5,000 never complained, do you really want to change the system for that one client complaint? Unless it's a safety thing, I don't think so. So don't be reactive to situations. Investigate and take the time to think about it. And this goes for everybody, leaders and not. Okay, so this one is something that happens very often in our practices, so I'll go ahead and read this. Uh, this is a story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was asked to do it. Everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. <laughs> and I love this phrase. I highly recommend you can look it up online and print it out. I highly recommend that you share this with your teammates because, and it's funny, but it's, and it's cute, but it's also very true. We tend to finger point and blame others because we didn't do something or something didn't get done. So we need to look at what's our communication. How can we make sure that these things don't happen in the future, right? Okay. So number five, inconsistent and poorly maintained policies. Those ones are really tough. And this can be team members and or leaders. It doesn't really matter. All of us are part of this. So you want to make sure that things are getting put in writing. And this is, I'm really big on this. So as a management consultant, I work with a lot of hospitals and I go in and I help them with different things. And my first thing is I always ask them is, do you have this in writing? So if it's like even how to place a catheter or how you guys do your wraps or how to run your autoclave, maybe your autoclave is different or, you know, whatever your anesthetic machine or how to check in a client. All those things should have a basic of being put in writing in an SOP. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be like a bullet point of how to do it, but putting things in writing really helps be able to train others, right? And it holds accountable to the specific rules that you guys created and putting it in writing kind of like, you know, you've documented it, right? So it's so important to maintain the policies. If they're all verbally discussed, people change it. If you've ever played the operator game where you have a message on one end and it, it's garbled by the time it gets to the other end, that's what happens a lot when it's just verbal communication. So putting things in writing helps solidify the regularity and the use of it. And everyone can help with it. So as a manager, I can't do everything myself. That's crazy. So I have elicited some of my team members to help me with something. Two of my techs at my first practice helped me make, actually, I wouldn't even say I did anything with it. I assigned them the marketing job of making this PowerPoint so we could play in the exam rooms. 
And they did a fantastic job. I just had them do it. And it was something I had tried to work on for three years and couldn't finish it. And they did it so fast within like two weeks. It was amazing. So everyone can help with this SOPs and, and whatever other promotional things you're trying to do. And if you have ideas with that, share that with your leadership team. And a really strong leadership team will be like, oh, yeah, I love your idea. Let's go ahead and utilize it. Or they tweak it or something like that. If they shut you down, that's different. We kind of talked about that earlier in the, the negativity of the leaders, the toxicity. Uh, make sure they have an employee handbook. This is really important so that everybody is the same. If you don't have one, ask for one. You know, and there's a lot of companies that can help write that depending on the laws in your state. You know, those are things that are really important to have consistent policies so that you have the same disciplinary policies for everybody. And one thing that's important too is that you don't make a policy and change it the next week. That sucks. I've seen that so much. And I used to do that a little bit. I don't anymore. Now I want to make a decision appropriately and change it only when necessary. If it's a real big reason or whatever, like, don't make policies and change them. Also, when you guys change something, like maybe you need to, there is a change curve. So there's a time that people need to get used to that and start utilizing it. So you don't want to just assume that it's not working. Everybody's not doing it correctly. Well, maybe you need to touch base again and re remind everybody how to do it when you have changed it recently, but don't change it frequently. That's the biggest uh, message I want to give you. And then if you feel like you have any of these things with having inconsistently poorly maintained policies, you know, talk to your manager about it. If you're part of that leadership team, make sure that you're enforcing it, making sure that if you have people that are making the same types of, say you have like five people who will constantly come in tardy, but yet you're only holding one person to that and everybody else is kind of just allowed to do it. That poorly maintained and inconsistent policy will cause negativity within the team in a toxic work environment, especially if they feel like that's favoritism. And these are all feeling based. And I get that I'm using the word feel a lot because sometimes it's a lot of this toxicity is feeling based, but some of it is also you're doing something that's causing this, right? Okay. So I can't see my slides. Sorry. This one. Okay. Lack of proper training. Number six, this one is huge. And I don't think we realize how important it is. And a lot of times we'll say, I'm too busy to train, but that is the worst response. And I'm going to talk about why. So you need to implement a training program. I get that you might not be responsible for this because your role is not the, the one to do that, but could you help with it? Could you participate in training the newer people? I know a lot of times people don't want to do that. They don't feel comfortable with it. But if you know how to do something really well, then maybe you can show that specific skill set to a new person. You know, maybe you can be part of that. But implementing a tra training program is that first step. And then having everybody understand why you need to put all the new people through training. And then maybe you need to even visit training again with the people who've been there a little bit longer to make sure they know all of the pieces. Because a lot of times we don't remember to tell things to people and they, there's a hole in their knowledge. So using phase training. Phase training is really great. Phase training is basically training in phases. So day one, you do this. And day one's like orientation. You know, get all the paperwork. You observe a little bit. You're not accountable to any specific duties or whatever. You're just really observing and learning. And then, you know, day one, week one, week two, week three, whatever. And usually face training is about 90 days. And it's in writing where you're doing a checklist, marking things off. You're making sure that you're learning a lot of the basic components of the position, your policies, protocols, and those kinds of things. And by using the face training, it really helps make sure that everybody's learning the things that they need to learn. It's hard to learn everything on week one, right? Because who knows what you're going to have coming in the hospital. But using face training over a period of time can ensure that the training is done. Now, you need to participate in that. So again, if you are really good at shooting x-rays, maybe you're the person that teaches the new people and that's when they, the trainer can send them to you. I think everybody should have a trainer. Not necessarily that's their only position, but that's something that they also focus on. And then also people can help with that. Okay, so team members need to be willing to participate. Don't say, I don't do training. I've had people tell me that. And I'm like, okay, well, I can't do all the training in the hospital. You know, I need help. So be willing to be part of that, you guys. Seriously, if you're really good at a skill set, please be willing to teach others that skill set. That doesn't mean that you have to do their entire training, maybe just a piece of it. Maybe I can send someone to you when you're really good at a specific skill and helping them understand. Okay, be patient with the new people. That's really important. People do not learn things in a week or two. It takes on average about four to six months for them to really know how to do all the components of their job. Even when they come in experience. I've been in this field for almost 20 years. I could not walk into any of your hospitals and know how to do everything the way you guys do it because I have to learn your specifics. Everybody has a different way of scheduling. Everybody has a different way of communicating messages. Everybody has a different computer software program. So it takes time for people to learn those things. And you can't expect them to be fast and learn it right away. There are some people that are learning things more quickly. And if they come with experience or certain skill sets they're already going to have that you may not have to teach them, but maybe they do it a little differently than you guys do. 
So you have to show them how your hospital does these things. You know, you may have different pieces of equipment than they're used to, or, or your monitoring equipment is different or whatever. So being recognizing that it takes time for them to learn that and be kind to them during that time. Don't say negative things that they should already know how to do this or whatever, you know, because that isn't necessarily true. Okay, so gossip. This is huge, guys. I can't say enough about why gossip is bad. A lot of you mentioned, if I went back to my Mentimeter and looked at those previous slides, it shows you guys said gossip, bullying. That's part of that. So gossip is not necessarily the managers, although I know one person said that their manager is saying negative things in front of other team members, but gossip is everybody. And this is kind of like when we are frustrated about something or we're bothered by the way someone's doing something or whatever, we tend to share it with others. I've done it myself. I'm, I'm not above that. I wish I could tell you I've never gossiped in my life, but I would be a liar if I said that to you. So remember, if I have a problem with an individual person and I go to another person and tell them all about my problem, did I actually solve the problem or did I only sort of make myself feel better briefly? So think about that. A lot of those gossips are just because we're frustrated with someone and we're not talking to that person about why we're frustrated. We're talking to other people about why we're frustrated. Well, then that's kind of creates a circle of negativity because now other people are involved. And sometimes people don't want to hear negative things about other people. There's some people, I've had many employees come to me and say, Melissa, this person keeps coming to me and gossiping about these things and saying all this, and I don't really want to hear it, but I don't know how to approach them. You know, So we've had to talk about that, saying to the person that I really don't want to participate in this conversation and then walking away You know, and being able to have that communication. But the first step is when you're bothered by someone, just go to that person and tell them you're bothered. I know it sounds easy. It's not. I know it's not easy, but it gets easier the more you practice it. And if you have open communication amongst your team members and your coworkers, it gets easier to the point where you guys actually are more respectful of one another. And I do think that requires the management to help with that too, to encourage an open communication, open dialogue within team members. But the most important thing is you can recognize is if you're contributing to the toxicity in your practice by constantly gossiping, you are part of the problem. And obviously I don't know everyone on here. I know there's 82 of you. I can see it on my, my screen, but I'm not even looking at your names, but just look at yourself because we have a tendency to not see that we're participating or contributing to it. But if you're gossiping regularly and being negative about other team members in that gossip, you are contributing to toxicity in your own work environment. And we have to stop doing this in order to stop that toxicity in that way. Okay. So this is a quote from Steve Jobs. And I really do believe in this, you know, that practice that I was at, that I was vomiting blood and leaving that practice a few months later. And I have made a lot of my active decisions deciding where I want to go next based kind of on this sentence. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only, what, only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. Don't settle. So there's sometimes things you can't change about the toxicity in your work environment. So don't settle. Don't just say, okay, this is what it is. I'm stuck with it. You know, see if there's things you can do differently that you can influence it and then recognize that you don't want to be in a negative environment every single day, but also make sure that you're not contributing to the negative environment too, because sometimes people go from hospital to hospital because they don't realize they're actually contributing to the toxicity themselves. So really look at that when you make those decisions. So I'm going to go back into the chat. I have completed my presentation. I was trying to go faster. I guess I was a little faster than it. I still have 11 minutes. Oh my gosh, I'm so much faster. Let's go into the chat. Uh, I was like thinking it was 50 minutes and I'm like, wait, no, we have an hour. Okay, so I love, I'm going to go back and look. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm looking at uh, Laura's comment. I love that. Supporting each other uh, through difficult clients is very important. I gave a talk on Wednesday where I told, I was with a lot of practice owners and I told the practice owners that sometimes you have to fire those clients that are jerks. You have to really not just keep them and tolerate it. And it was interesting to see kind of their reactions to my suggestions of sometimes clients are total jerks and we don't want to you know, have them be part of our team anymore or be mean to our team or whatever. So I, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, we should not be so judgmental of our clients. That too. So it's kind of works both ways. Us being judgmental can be negative, but sometimes they're also... I had a friend who has a hospital that the client ran to the treatment area the other day and was screaming and cussing at them. So that's not appropriate. They fired her. They fired that client, which is good. Um, passing judgment is toxic. We don't know what else is going on in our lives. I love that. Thank you. Something that help, has helped me is to assume good intentions. Um, that was my biggest takeaway from the books. Oop, I, oops, I became a manager. Walk in my shoes experience. Great. Asking for help. You guys, this is awesome. This chat messages. I love it. 
should be reporting, rewarding good behaviors and not punishing bad behaviors. Yes. And that actually also, um, that's something that we can do for ourselves. You know, like yesterday I was on a call with a, a supervisor in Northern California specialty practice. And I got a lot of compliments about that supervisor when I was there at the hospital last month. So I told her, Hey, your team really gave you a lot of compliments. I made sure to, c- to communicate that to her because I knew it would be nice for her to hear that positive message. So that can be you guys too, telling each other really nice things about yourselves. It's not always just the leadership or management. Um, you don't have to be best friends, but you should be respectful. Yep. Um, I love that uh, Sarah says that she's and reworking the SOPs. Team, help her with that. You guys, I mean, I know all of you are in her team, but have your team help you with reworking those SOPs. It's, it makes it a little easier. Um, struggling to develop training, uh, being a new supervisor, a new position where this position is new, that can be a challenge, especially when people aren't used to that. Melissa, How do you disperse clicks? Yes, go ahead. Have one question in the Q&A. Oh, so. Perfect, go ahead and read it. Um, or I can... How do you disperse cl- clicks in the clinic? Oh, that's funny. I was actually just looking at that one. I was, I was going to answer that. Question. Yeah, I think they put it in the chat and then they put it in the Q&A. So. Yeah. Um, so one thing that you can do is it, it's hard if you're part of that click. So one thing I like to do everywhere, I was just at the VHMA conference last month, right? Or I'm sorry, not last month, last week. God, it feels like a month ago, but it was just last week. And I like to welcome everyone that's sitting at my table, right? Because you're this, And so I said hi and introduced myself to everyone. So at your practice, you can make sure that you are talking to the newer people, that you're talking to everyone when you come in and that you're encouraging that positivity within your space, right? If you're a leader, then sometimes you can do like if you've ever gone to a meeting and usually people sit with their friends, but maybe you have them sit in different places. You know, if you're able, you have a team meeting and then everybody sits together, reception here, text there, maybe you actually have them sit. And you can also have team building exercises, fun games that they can do that can help encourage team building. The cross training can also help with that. It's hard. You can't necessarily go up to them and say, hey, you guys are a click. You need to disperse. (laughs) But you can try to encourage inviting new people in, maybe assigning a buddy to uh, if I hate to use the term mean girl. But if you have that one person that's kind of leading it, maybe assigning that person a buddy or assigning a second person in that click a buddy with a new person so that they can kind of become friends with, I don't know, like good friends, but they can become good coworkers with one another. It's basically kind of trying to get other people to work within that click that you have and making sure that you're not contributing to that in the way that you're handling things. So I think those are just, it's hard to do, um, but it can be done if you, if especially if you're a leader, you can make it happen a little bit more easily. But I think the best thing to do is intermingle new people into that click to the best of your ability and then making sure that you're being the nice person and welcoming them. Um, and I was going to say really quick before I see there's another question, Rhonda, if you want to put in the chat, uh, Rhonda and I are good friends and business partners in a sense, and we um, have a compassion fatigue Facebook group. So if you want to put that in the chat, if anybody hasn't joined it already, to let them know, that would be awesome. Because I think sometimes we haven't really talked about compassion fatigue, but I know a few people, a few people mentioned it in their answers. Okay. And also so, there's a, Melissa, there's a question Yes. It's in the chat. It's not the Q&A. So it's a pretty oh. big, um, she put it in the Q, uh, the chat. I'm sorry. So um, it's the second to the last one. Oh, the, the wedding one? Yes, yes. Okay. So when I got married, um, I'm, I'm, I've been married uh, multiple, well, twice, but um, technically three times. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But when I got married uh, a few years ago, I felt really bad because I wanted to invite my team, but I also didn't, I couldn't afford to pay for all of my team. So I actually scheduled it as a, at a time where most people were working so that it wouldn't be uh, an issue. Um, but I think, you know, what I would do honestly, is I would just let them know like, Hey, you know, we're unable to invite everybody to our wedding, but maybe have a party at the hospital to celebrate with everyone and tell them how much you care that they're in your life, but unfortunately, you just it's such an expense you can't afford to do it because most people can understand that, right? It's weddings are expensive, so you can't afford to do that. So if you can't control the timing of it, um, you I would say try to have like a little mini party at your practice or something and celebrate with food or whatever, and that might not have to be as expensive. And maybe even the practice owner can help support that. It can be like a little team building event, um, but I would say it's okay to say, you know, I can't afford for everybody to come. Um, yeah. And that won't add to the click, but I mean, if you have like a couple of really good friends, that's a, 
that actually my best friend was one of my technicians at the time and she came to the wedding and I didn't invite anyone else um that her and I had a really good balance though that everybody like she and I didn't work directly together so it was a little easier for me um I'm it looks like you have three questions in the Q&A okay. Lisa all right so if you I can help you with that a little bit more if you want to put uh you have my email information in the Oh yeah, it's in my slide. Uh, duh, it's on the yes. screen. If you feel like emailing Melissa, the, the Melissa is the person who asked me the question. If you like emailing, I can answer you that a little bit more in depth um, for you about the wedding question. Uh, okay, so Catherine, what is the best way to help get rid of team negativity towards a single person? Well, I would sit down and individually talk to those team members who are being negative and find out why they're being negative. Does it have merit? Is this single person actually a problem or is it just their perception so i would individually talk to every one of those people not as a group but as an individual and then talk to that team member that you think they're being negative to and find out what their perception of how they're doing having regular check-ins with your team or your coworkers can really benefit that so i would actually talk to each one of those people and figure out why they're being negative uh, have you successfully employed some personality testing? Um, I'm not good at that, but yes, I have utilized it. Um, I actually did Myers-Briggs many years ago and I had um, some disc training at one of my practice. We also did color training at one of my practices, but I had it brought in by one of the reps because I'm not qualified to, to actually administer it, but you can have, I would talk to your reps and see if they can come in and do the personality testing. Because what we did when we did the disc tra training and that was one where they used dogs, but we were, I was at my cat hospital. So we used cat, cat version of it. And they made like a printout and they put everybody's results on this big giant poster. And so we actually kept the poster on the wall so people could see it. So they could determine like, this is how you communicate with a D and an I and whatever. And so that actually was really helpful. So people could reference back what the different personality types were and how they should communicate best with them. So yes, I think personality types are really great as long as you continue to utilize it. But just remember, it's only good for that meeting because then you get new people and then you have to mix them in uh, with that. So um, how is a technician bringing the team together without stepping on toes? This one can be a challenge because you don't know how people are gonna receive that. Um, so in some ways you can maybe talk to the manager first and see like, hey, what do you think about trying to do some team building exercises? and see if you have specific ideas and they can maybe put in their own ideas and you can do them regularly in a meeting, right? If you can't talk to your manager about it when you, or you wanna just do it as an individual, try to have fun games that you play with each other. You know, maybe do things that generate a positive outcome. And you can't force people to just like each other all of a sudden. This is a slow transition. This re requires everybody to be contributing positive things into that work environment. So trying to bring in games, um, but like appropriate games, there is like team building stuff you can do. Talk to your manager, see if you can do that, or just try a little bit of on your own, maybe fun videos that people can watch, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I think it's hard when you're worried about stepping on toes. If you email me, I can think about some more really good things that you can try to do as well. Um, but I think that that's kind of the place to start. Talk to your manager and start doing team building stuff within. We did a scavenger hunt at one of my practices and it was a lot of fun because the team had to find things. And then um, it really helped the receptionist understand where things were and why we did certain things. And so we did that kind of stuff. So those kind of games are fun. So go online and look up fun team building games because there may be something you guys can do in your practice um, just by trying that. And they're usually fun. You know, I like the finding someone in common, something in common, having people like find something in common with someone else. And then you'll, you'll learn how, how much stuff they have in common. And you try that one. I like that one too. All right, so let's go in the chat and see. Disc training, good. Um, yes, leadership. Um, oh, thanks, Rhonda. So Rhonda did put in the Compassion Fatigue support page. If anybody is interested in joining, we do welcome all people that work in an animal hospital. It doesn't matter what position you're in. Um, we encourage everyone. We try to talk about things that can help us have less compassion fatigue and burnout. Uh, and it's, you know, a lot of times it's pictures and messages and, and memes and things, but you know, really thinking about what you're reading is really helpful. And we encourage people to share their stories and things like that as well. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me, reach out to me. You can follow me on social media um, at South Coast Vet Solutions. And I also have a YouTube channel, but I couldn't get the YouTube link to come on here. So I couldn't put it on there, but you 100% can follow me on any of those sources. I always do put pictures of the presentations I'm doing on my Instagram so that, you know, people can see it. 
unfortunately I can't see your faces, so I couldn't put your pictures in there, but I will put a picture of the slides. So any other questions anybody has? I don't see any other questions. Um, and I would like to thank you, Melissa. It was, it was a really great uh, lecture. I learned a lot too and took some pictures. I think the things you put up about, you know, what you learn in kindergarten and about your workplace, those are really, really true things. So, yeah. And are you sending them the PDF of the slides or do I need to send that if to you? If you want to send it to me, I can send it out to everybody. Yeah. Absolutely. I can send the PDF. That's fine. Because I don't yeah. can have it and talk to their team about it. I think it's Because then I'll just send it to the ones that attended the session. So perfect. Thank you. Okay. So everyone, um, our next session is at 1130. So go get some more coffee, grab a breakfast, but be back at 1130 for our next session with Rhonda with Gaslighting, a guide to burning your practice culture to the ground. That sounds like a fun one. <laughs> so we'll yes. see everyone, yeah, we'll see everyone <laughs> in a half hour. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye.